<laughs> Hello? <laughs> Who's messing around out here? Hello? Jim Jiminy, Jim Jiminy, Jim Jim Jiminy. Who is it? Show yourself. Oi, mister. Give me mum. Hello, everybody. Hi, welcome back, everyone. How's January treating you? Oh, my goodness. For me, it is uh, grey, it is dark, it is cold, early mornings and late nights. Yeah, this treat me like a dog. Treat me like a dog. Oh, how are you, Alistair? Yeah, when when Heather from EastEnders comes out of the Everage shelter sort of waving her rolling pin, that's January. <laughs> that's how January's treat me so far. We're moving on to... Again, I feel like recently it's been banger after banger after banger. I was going to say one of the best episodes, well, two of the best episodes of series one, banger after banger after banger, it is The Empty Child and the Doctor Dances. This episode is a certified banger. It's, uh, once again, this is one of the the strongest episodes of all time. Um, So we're really going to struggle to bring any critiques to the table this week. If you came to Hulala looking for nuance and insight um you're not going to get it this week you're going to get unfiltered nostalgia with a little kind of cherry on top this one's a true great this is a stephen moffat i think first first stephen moffat episodes of doctor who first stephen moffat episode yeah written by stephen moffat and directed by james halls who's directed doctor who before as well as shows like merlin mad dogs uh, penny dreadful and black mirror yeah all of stephen moffat's episodes of doctor who written under rusty davies are perfection mm-hmm. and even in his own era stephen moffat is really the master of creating really scary monsters no one does it i think as good as him he is god of doing that Mm -hmm. so he does it again here he does it again i think this is the first kind of horror of new doctor who well actually no i'd say maybe the unquiet dead is sort of like very horror-esque vibes i don't remember as a kid being very scared of it i don't remember if it was one of the ones i was gate kept from watching or not but um oh i did yeah i never really remember being scared of this episode i don't know why but it is scary i certainly was scared of this episode so at this point remember i was banned from watching episode three the unquiet dead Mm -hmm. i was allowed to watch the later episodes because they got a bit less scary Mm. but the second half of this two-parter i ran out of the room (laughs) so there was a point where the doctor has kind of sent the child back to its room Mm -hmm. and they're playing this tape and then the tape stops but his voice continues because he's in the room and it's like the tape stopped like no i remember exactly what the line was he goes can't you feel it in the walls and um at that point i was like something's gonna happen something's gonna happen happen." (laughs) they're like they're like calm down calm down i I thought the doctor was about to turn into a gas mask person oh my god can you imagine and i couldn't handle it like the tension was way too much for me like the shattered Mm -hmm. glass like the the building dread i, I it's was, the bit I when the kid as well he's like i'm here now can't you see me yeah and they're like yeah Ooh. i was right out i remember running up the stairs away from the living room because i was like no 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 honestly it has so many i think that whoever they cast as that kid did such a great job of making him like so like in his voice he's so young and like fresh and he's so endearing fresh. but then utterly terrifying and like harrowing and horrible yeah i don't know if i don't know how you tell a child to sound creepy i don't know how you get that out of them i think you cast a creepy child you know get them to do the kind of i'm here mommy can't you see me like how do you get that performance out i know willingly willingly child actors are terrifying aren't they I know, all of them. Um, do you want to go all through a quick them. recap of the... <laughs> Every single one. Every single child. Oh my God, Trunchbull was right, Trunchbull was right. Um, so these episodes are released on the 21st and 28th of May 2005, and we see the Doctor and Rose following an unknown object hurtling towards Earth, which ends up landing in London during the Blitz. As the Doctor investigates, Rose is separated and left hanging from a barrage balloon and is saved by falling from Captain Jack Harkness, a time agent looking to strike a deal with another time traveller. 
The Doctor meets Nancy and learns of her brother Jamie, the empty child, who's now a gas mask zombie looking for his mummy. After meeting Dr. Constantine, he quickly learns that the condition the child has is deadly and spreads through touch. He meets with Rose and Jack and learns that Jack is a con man who sent the space junk, which turns out to be a Tula warship full of nanogenes, microscopic organisms designed to mend and heal during wars. They discover that after crashing, the first human that the nanogenes met was the child, already dead and wearing a gas mask, so thinking that's what humans should look like, they spread the virus and inadvertently create an army led by the child. Just before the bomb is meant to hit the crash site, Nancy tells Jamie that she is in fact his mummy and hugs him, which allows the nanogenes to recognise the maternal DNA and bring Jamie back to his true self. The doctor spreads the upgrade across all the victims, proclaiming that just once everybody lives. Jack stops the bomb from hitting the crash site and joins the TARDIS team with the doctor and Rose. Oh, that's a great summary. Once again, you write those so well. Thank you. I kind of watch the episodes and then I'll write it up because I'm like fresh out of the memory and I don't want it to sound too much like a regurgitate of everything. I just want the feel of the episode. What did you think of this episode? Well, I loved it. It's really creepy. Um, It's definitely one of my favourites. I think actually the Blitz is just kind of a creepy setting. Mm-hmm. This this story happens completely at night, doesn't it? I think on one on one night actually doesn't it yeah no it's all in one night they land uh around dinner time because that's when the siren goes off and she gets the meal and it finishes yeah so it's early morning yeah yeah so i guess it's kind of a, a horrible place to be anyway in that you're in this context kind of surrounded by death and rubble which isn't very pleasant mm-hmm. and um yeah it's really frightening it takes place in yeah hospitals and abandoned railway stations mm-hmm. and it's all quite um dark but it's definitely one of the best i mean certainly one like most iconic monsters and another really sad story again i'm realizing this series has a lot of really tragic stories Mm. and this is another one of them where no one's actually malicious in this episode there's no malice at all it's one of the scariest stories but there's not actually any villain in this it's Mm -hmm. just horrifying all the way through so i mean i love it i think it's it's very good on Mm rewatch um it's not a monster you can ever bring back but it it was great i'm glad it was a two-parter this is the thing you're exactly right that they could never bring back the gas mask zombies it's not the kind of thing you can do again but i think they did it perfectly because some of the best horror is when the villain quote unquote thinks they're doing something right and i guess you think that the empty child is the villain and then you find out the person or the thing that caused the issue is the nanogenes but all they do all their purposes is to try and heal people and help people and they genuinely are just working to their programming and what they think is right and when the first thing they see is this dead child they just try and like help him and bring him back to life and so there really is no malice there's no villain but it does cause a problem and it's something that they have to solve throughout the episode. And I think hilarity and horror ensue. This is another episode where it really is scary, but there's so much funny in it as well. And I think that's something that I know Stephen Moffat wrote it, but within Russell's era, within Stevens as well, I think that he really like towed the line well between having a really scary, deep, dark moment. And then, you know, the doctor's going, go to your room. I'm very, very angry with you. And it just like makes it really funny and brings it back round again. That's so true. And again, we see some of that lovely lightness and comforting character of the ninth doctor. He thrives walking in horrible situations Mm -hmm. and being the light in those situations. Yeah, no, completely agree. I think that, because a character like him has come from so much darkness, I think that he then does bring out light because no matter what horrible situation is, and I don't know if this was the intention when they're writing it, but no matter what the horrible situation he's in, he's just come from a war that's killed his entire species. It's not that deep. Do you know what I mean? It's not that deep. It's just not that. It's just not that deep. Even though we're looking at the extinction of the human race, turning everyone into a gas mask and it's too late for everyone. Exactly. I I noticed there was a lot of time war parallels as well on this that I had missed again. Mm. Like such glaringly obvious ones. But I think to be honest, first time around with this episode, I was so young, I don't think I even really followed the plot. Like I don't think until I rewatched it a few times, I even really understood the kind of the complexity of them chasing this thing through the time vortex Mm -hmm. and then the fact they'd been thrown it by jack and then that was a decoy and what the nanogenes had done i don't think i actually really understood the resolution for quite a long time yeah um but there was loads that i missed within this so there was some really literal ones as well that were really obvious (laughs) the doctor's talking to nancy in the second episode and he says who did you lose and she's like what he's like the way you look after all those kids is because you lost somebody you're doing this to make up for it and i was like oh right you're like doing this to make up for it like oh the survivor guilt like right got it as a kid there was no way that i got that like i was like 
I, I probably was like, how does he know that? How does he know that? But it's how does so. He know that he's very intuitive. Literally, he really does think that one. Uh, but no, you're completely right. There are some really great time war parallels in here, and I think that because of all the horrible things he's gone through, that's why he does bring so much lightness. I think is a really good word into it. Like he's very caring. I think he can be incredibly stern, but he is also such a caring doctor. And it's a bit like in Father's Day when he was talking to Stuart and Sarah, and he was like, "I will do my best. I will try and save you." I think that he yeah. really does have those soft moments with Nancy where he he needs something from her. He is sort of like following her and egging her for information, but he makes it clear that like he's on her side. Yes, very true. The doctor, the ninth doctor is like almost like someone you want to get on the right side of. Oh, completely. Like he's so sweet to the people he wants to be sweet to. And he's always mm-hmm. kind to kind of vulnerable and frightened people. Yeah. You don't want to be the one he's on the kind of angry end of. No, completely. Um, the fury on of the the angry world. end of. You don't be one of the ones he's pissed at. That's the words I'm looking for. <laughs> That's very true. I would not want to be. So true. There was another one that I missed as well, which is super literal. Um, <laughs> the doctor in the hospital played as well mm-hmm. by the marvellous Richard Wilson. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a casting as well for this, by the way. He was fantastic in this. Such good casting. I remember like, even as a kid, I knew him from One Foot in the Grave and just seeing him in so this. So I. Yeah. And like, it's such a different role for him compared to that. And he just brought so much weight and gravitas to the role. And I love his posh, croaky accent. He's like, you have to find Nancy. The very literal quote is he said, before this war, I was a father and a grandfather. And now I am neither, but I'm still a doctor. And he goes, oh yeah, I know the feeling. And it was like, Oh, yeah, there's another one. Okay. <laughs> They're just littered throughout the series. Littered. Absolutely littered. And I, I missed every single one. I was so focused on Bad Wolf. But no, this is, the th- this is the thing. Exactly. Like, I find that, like, when I was watching, I mean, watching the series originally, I wasn't picking up on any of it. But, like, as I would watch it growing up, I would mainly be looking for Bad Wolf. And then now, it's only really, truly doing these rewatches that I've noticed just how many parallels there are to the Time War, how much it's written into his character. Because I always kind of, as a kid watching it, thought, okay, they did the Time War so that you weren't focusing on the Time Lords and you can just see the Doctor as himself. And I just thought that was it. Okay, you've taken the Time Lords out of the situation and you were not focusing on them. But mm. when you watch the series back, you see that every single episode is focusing on them. Like he's thinking about them all the time. That his decisions are being based on them. The way he's reacting to situation is based on the Time War. It's so obvious when you stop and think about it and watch it again, but... Yeah, but didn't make up any of that at all. Let me shoehorn in. This episode is the original Oi Mister, You Me Dad. <laughs> in that, very literally, Oi Miss, You Me Ma'am. <laughs> but Oi Mister, You Me Dad. Um, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the Oi Mister, You Me Dad doll, but that <sighs> is essentially the monster we're dealing with here. So I want everyone to talk about this because Alistair briefly brought this up before we started recording. I have never <laughs> heard of this meme before. I had never heard of it. I can't believe you haven't heard of it. It's such a well-known meme. Oi, Mr. Yumi Dad. It's not even slightly new. It's like a six-year-old oh, meme. Yeah, no, no. I know it's not new, but like I, I like I just have somehow completely missed this one. And I want to see like if other people know this meme because so far I feel like I've got like pie on my face. I'm like, oh, I must be the only one in the world that doesn't know this meme. <laughs> Am I chronically online? Am I the problem? I don't think I'm the problem. Maybe I am. I don't think I'm the problem. So talking of Dr. Constantine, we can't glide past the horrific on-screen transformation from loving (gasps) Victor Mildrew into a oh. gas mask zombie and the sounds that he when he goes like oh, yeah. and then like you hear cracking yeah. and crunching and like his that was my impression that was a very good impression his eyeballs be better on microphone yeah I, i'm looking forward to listening to it back his are you um no it's so horrific and i remember hearing that i think it was in a dvd documentary Stephen moffat had said that at one point they considered i don't i don't know they ever put it in but they considered having a sound effect of his skull cracking Ew, where no. it's like the gas mask is like growing over his head and compressing his face and crack because because the whole point is that it was a gas mask of a child oh, so it's like that's horrible. too small for his face and it's like cracking his skull and I mean, I am very glad they didn't go in that room because I think they still got the message across. But later in the episode then, when all the people, when the virus is airborne and all the people are turning into zombies and Rose is like, what's keeping us safe? And the doctor's like, nothing. That, I think, was the moment I shit myself when I was a kid. I was like, whoa. Plot. 
That's what's <laughs> keeping you safe. Plot. No, because they stay fine for quite a long time mm. after that, for a further kind of 10 minutes. Um, that's funny. They they tread the line of horror then, I guess, quite carefully because the sound effects they came with, they are horrible. And the kind of gagging and the kind of almost like they describe it in the episode, like, there's something going to push mm-hmm. up your throat, like, you're going to be sick. Um, and the way, like, the way the mask kind of pops out of his mm-hmm. mouth and it stretches his face forward and then the big, like, horrible empty eyes growl. It's, you know, really freaky. Um, but it sounds almost like creaking, like, leather. Yeah. Like, it's believable that it's maybe just the texture of the mask mm-hmm. and not bone. But it it, it, it it's still does the job. Treads that. Yeah. It, oh, it does the job. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this episode had been made a bit later. Because I think the closest parallels to this episode that I can think of are in The Idiot's Lantern, where something happens where a lot of people have been physically changed. And by the end of the episode, you manage to undo it and they're all fine. And the big sort of gag of the episode is that Rose becomes one of the faceless people. And I do wonder Mm. if they would have ever... I don't think I've ever heard that this was an idea. I don't think this was ever, like, scripted or anything. This is just me thinking. I wonder if they would ever consider have making Rose a gas mask zombie as, like, the cliffhanger and or like halfway through the second episode and that being like a force of motivation for the doctor to be like no we're not going to stop them we're going to save them right i guess so i think it's nice though like rub into the last second you don't think there's a fix you think that he needs to overcome the zombies um Mm. and that makes it kind of even more kind of mysterious what the resolution could possibly be in the last five minutes even though it ends up totally making sense yeah so i guess yeah i'm really glad they didn't do that but yeah it must have been a consideration at one point it would have worked pretty well i know what you're saying yeah i just think it would have been such a gag seeing someone you've been following the whole season like turn it's a bit like when the doctor quote unquote died in father's day like obviously you know he's not dead you know that it'll be resolved but it's still a gag mama and talking of the resolution one of the funny moments is dr constantine my legs grown back. <laughs> well, there is a war, and is it possible you miscount it? I think that this episode has burst so many just incredible quotes just for this episode, but also like stuff within Doctor Who. Like, I love the bit when um Nancy's asking the doctor how he found her, and he's like, My nose has special powers, and she's like, Do you really have special powers too? And he's like, What do you mean? <laughs> like he's really like, What was that supposed to mean? Um, also, um, I like bananas, bananas good. Birth of that quote as well. That was great, but I think better than that is the lines leading up to it where he talks about the weapons factories. He said, Oh, I visited there once, and he said, Ah, mm. oh, yeah, shame, they all got destroyed when the reactor went into overload, and he's like as I said, once. But it's quite casually badass. It wasn't arrogantly badass. Yeah. It was delivered in a genuinely quite almost like, yeah, I blew it up kind of way, um, which I really yeah. enjoyed. And then the fact he kind of grew a banana plantation on the old site um, in the heart of the city where there used to be a weapons factory. Mm-hmm. It was incredibly doctory. You kind of imagine... That the Very seventh, doctory, yeah. It's, it's the sort of thing then, that detail makes it quite like, oh, maybe the seventh doctor did that. You know, I can imagine the, yeah. the seventh doctor doing something as obscure as then kind of planting a banana tree at the end, you know, just as a random what the fuck. <laughs> I'd never really thought I'd never really thought about that. But it's so funny, like when the doctor does reference things that he's done off screen, it's like wholly viable and likely that he's not talking about like that incarnation of the doctor. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine I can imagine five doing that. I can imagine I can imagine John Pertwee doing that. But but I know John Pertwee is mainly on Earth. Like, but I can fully imagine seven doing Or indeed that. the war doctor. <laughs> could have been the war doctor. It could have been the war doctor. It could have been John Hurt. Um I it doesn't. It doesn't feel very John Hurt. It doesn't feel at the end of it. I think he was going through some. What stuff. What if he? What if John Hurt blew up the factory and then the ninth Doctor? The first thing he did was plant a banana grove. I can see that. I would. I have questions about his priorities, <laughs> but sure. Yeah, perhaps he had time. Right at the end of the day, the Doctor once he regenerated. That was the first thing he did. That big smiling grin went and planted a banana grove. <laughs> One other thing that I noticed that was not a setup, but you know, kind of works as a setup. If you're a fan of the Timeless Child story mm. arc, speaking to an audience of, I think, one, <laughs> there's a line about kind of Jack's motivations in this are that he's kind of annoyed at the time agents because they stole two years of his memories mm. and he doesn't know if he did bad things in that time or not. He does a glance over to the doctor and is like, your friend there doesn't trust me. And as far as I know, he's got every reason not mm-hmm. to. And uh, the Doctor does this kind of like look down. And if you wanted to read into it, you'd be like, ah, because the Doctor knows they're missing some memories too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've had their memories stolen by the, you know, 
by division or whatever. But um, I think that we've said this before, there's no real Doctor Who canon. It's all fun. It's all whatever. I think that if they wanted to lean into the Timeless Child like storyline, there are so many plot points in Classic and New Who where you could say, you could like retroactively be like, that was the time of the child, that was the time of the child, that was the time of the child. And it would make sense and seem like it really was embedded in the DNA of the show. I just don't see them. I, I see them. I don't think they're going to ignore it. I just don't think they're going to, like they won't retcon it. I think they'll just not bring it up again. I don't think they'll bring it up again. I mean, we might be surprised. I don't think they will. I think they need something of a fresh slate anyway to give a new entry entry point for for new viewers but um mm -hmm. maybe it'll come up in the future maybe a few series down the exactly. line exactly um i do want to spend a little bit of time talking about captain jack now i know as all of the listeners will have know there's a whole controversy surrounding john barrowman which it's not really our place to go into i don't want to tread those waters but we're a queer doc 2 podcast and i don't think we can glance past the fact that this episode does bring us the very first openly queer character in doctor who yeah it was it was a pretty major thing that jack was omnisexual yeah no exactly i like i really like how they use the metaphor of dancing in this where rose says that she's gonna go distract the guards and jack's like i've been around this guy quite a while you're not his type i'll go distract him and rose this like 19 year old from the council estate in london in 2005 she's like what and the doctor's <laughs> like well he's from the like fifty thousand years in the future he's just a bit more casual when it comes to dancing and she's like how, how casual how flexible and I'm like, <laughs> she's horrified you're so gay you're so gay i wonder if then when jack came back rose just ran up to him and went you're so gay you know what though rose is believably 2005 her attitudes are realistic and that's okay yeah she's for not sure. perfect but um yeah, she's a little surprised. I mean, I guess the element she takes surprise with is is the alien aspect. That's maybe her cover. But to be honest with you, I think she's a little mm. upset. He's by. <laughs> I think that, yeah. she's a bit like. I think that he, yeah. Like what? No, I was kissing. I think her. she's like ew, and the doctor's like, "What do you mean?" And she's like, uh, "Aliens, ew." Yeah, yeah, aliens, right? Yeah, 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 aliens, aliens. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. sure. Um, I think he's a really well written queer character. I don't think that he ever. He's not like well, me and my gaze, but the way that he like playfully banters, because he's from the future and I don't think he really like cares about the quote unquote threat of the war to him. Like he is very openly queer in the 1940s and like slaps the guy's bum right at the beginning and you can see the guy kind of likes yeah. it. And I think that he, it's, it's very well written into his character. I think as like a time traveler from the future that he isn't really hiding who he is in whatever period he jumps into. He's like, I know I can protect myself. I'm just going to be me. I guess so. I guess he's taking liberties with the fact that he knows he's safe and can afford to be arrogant. Um, I guess, like, the realistic mm. context, of course, would be that for, for actual gay men in the 1940s, they absolutely would not have been able to risk doing anything that open. And oh, of course. Um, the consequences would have been very severe for them. Um, the only criticism, I guess, mm. I would say that comes to mind right now of Captain Jack's characterization in these episodes not thinking too much about all the kind of tortured stuff that comes after this or even in later series um because it's like a whole bunch of like moral greatness you can bring into it but he's quite a mm. hypersexual character which isn't i'm is not a negative thing but i guess his like mm. bi or pen pansexuality is linked quite closely with also being like painfully flirtatious and all the way through mm. this he's also shown to be a bit of a player he's shown to be quite unreliable he'll kind of ditch you as soon as it's inconvenient so i mean you could draw parallels mm -hmm. and like draw issues with that but that's all like an important part of his character i guess so i mean he's still a great character he's an interesting mm. character they keep him around for a bit longer he appears in the next episode of boomtown he appears in the two-part finale and of course he then goes on to leave his own spin-off show so we've got plenty of captain jack after this exactly and i do think that a lot of people have commented on this as well about Stephen Moffat's writing. He's kind of been like labeled as like the horny oh writer God, so horny. and he does write a lot of characters. I think like River comes to mind, Clara comes to mind, the 11th Doctor comes to mind where he just has like so much horn in his writing. He's such it's like, a horny writer. Okay, we get no, it. he is. Yeah, he really exactly. Is. He, and I think when you give him a... He writes like in, on, in so many ways he writes fantasies. And mm -hmm. I think the criticism definitely comes out for him with the way he writes women in that he loves to write kind of like impossible, really violent, really capable and like really, really horny. Um, All at the same time. 
and also like have some reason they like shouldn't exist um and also like are a psychopath is often like a yeah dimension. oh my god he loves writing the psychopath yeah river irene adler so many characters have that dimension to them um for some reason um one thing this is such a quick random little thing i think the cinematography in this episode is really really good uh mm. there's a shot of the phone ringing when the doctor's talking to nancy i sent it to alistair before we started recording this and it's really like sort of alfred hitchcock-esque where the camera's on a tilt so you're in a hallway but the hallway's at an angle and the phone is like taking up a good third of the screen and the doctor is taking up another third and then in the far distance you see nancy slightly out of focus and it, it's just such like you know they could have filmed it any type of way they wanted they could have filmed it i don't think the cinematography other than the cgi i'd say like when there's wide cgi shots and the cgi in this episode is quite good to be fair um i don't really find myself spotting interesting cinematography choices in doctor who it's not that explorative in that way but i think little choices like that in this episode really help me feel like this is much more of like a cinematic spectacle the two-parter feels a lot more like a movie where it's a movie and it feels like a movie where you would go to the movies it feels like a movie you know it's like when you go to a cinema <laughs> to see a movie rather than say like aliens of london and world war three which feels like a two-parter of a tv show yeah i see what you mean i think as well there's some cool stuff happening with like light and shadow i'm thinking of like when nancy's mm -hmm. hiding from the child in the house and it's just her and him and she realizes she's mm -hmm. left the door open and he's found her and i think you see yeah. his shadow before you see him but it's like his silhouette and there's that kind of thing's quite cool um mm -hmm. yeah there's a few bits of that there's some bits where it's quite jarring i mean i'm thinking of the very closing shot in the in the railway station you can kind of see the hospital yeah. on the horizon and it is a bit like copy paste picture of a hospital on a hill that mm -hmm. just wouldn't be there but there's you know apart from that you know exactly. it's, it's, it's certainly not bad i mean a lot of it's great i think the sets are really good as well for this like a lot mm -hmm. of like the streets they use and the way they decorate them you feel quite immersed in the london scene you feel mm. like you're quite you know in the time you're meant to be yeah i think filming it all at night it's like a really good stylistic choice for the theme of the horror but also i think that when you're filming something like this as like a wartime piece you can like darkness hides a multitude of sins and you can really make yourself feel like you're in any time period. And I think that doing it at night helps you really get immersed in the story rather than spotting like, oh, this doesn't look like 1940 or whatever. And so like, it makes me lean much more into the episode and I, I never really question it. I wonder if I left for the BBC drama department doing period pieces like episode three in Dickensian Cardiff and doing this one in mm. Blitz London. They've probably got a pretty good catalogue of kind of set pieces, references, I'm costumes sure. that they use all the time for other things. So there's probably quite a yeah. lot they could dig into as well that help bring this to life. I mean, I guess when you go to the future, you, you've got a much harder job in that you need to create a lot of stuff from scratch. Yeah. And, and some of that ends up looking really goofy. Mm. I, d I just have this image in my mind of them um, pulling out like costumes from Blackout of Four and just being like, yeah, these are fine. <laughs> these will do. These will do. And you know what? They probably did do that. They probably did. That's probably half of the costumes and soldiers for the budget that they had. Can we talk about the um, the dancing sex metaphors a little more? Oh my God. Yeah. No, like, yeah. I mean, this is an interesting shift. I mean, I kind of knew at the time that this was sort of what the metaphor was mm. like about the Doctor dances, but I don't know why this was a focus in this episode it was it was weird it was. like if you translate it quite literally the conversation's weird mm. between rose and the doctor like, why do you assume i don't have sex yeah and she's like oh i don't know mm, do you fuck he's like i fucked and it's like why is this a conversation you're now suddenly ha it's, i don't know i know well it's weird when you think about in that scene because she's obviously like 19 and he's like a 900 something whatever i think i always knew that whenever jack talked about dancing he was talking about sex and the scene when the doctor and rose are talking about jack and he's like She's like, is that what we do? We go out and spread the stars and we dance. I think I always knew I was like, oh, she's not talking about dancing. But that scene with the Doctor and Rose, I think it took me a while to realise that the context clues are there and they're talking about fucking. And like, yeah. And then at the end when they're listening to Glenn Miller, who, by the way, this was my sexual awakening for Glenn Miller. And by sexual awakening, I don't mean anything sexual. I mean, I now love Glenn Miller. <laughs> and this episode is fully the reason right. why I love Glenn Miller music. Um, 
<laughs> Bisexual awakening, I don't mean anything sexual. <laughs> Literally. I, like, I don't know if you ever... Sam quote. Yeah, that's me. I don't know if you ever listened to Glenn Miller at all, but like, I have a record player and I put on my Glenn Miller albums genuinely like every sort of... Like, it... How old is Glenn Miller? If I look up Glenn Miller right now, what am I about to find? Well, I mean, he was popular in the 1940s, so... He's dead. He's dead. He's, he's been he, dead. He died. He's been dead. He d- he was one of the people time. that had a mysterious death. He had a he flew up in a plane and the plane went missing and they never found him. Oh, I love. That's how I want to go. <laughs> oh my god. I want everyone to be trying to work it out. Ages. You want to be the next Amelia Earhart, please. Except, don't we know where she went? Didn't she get eaten by? Didn't Amelia like end up on like? An island where she was like eaten by crabs or something. I don't know. I knew she flew away, and I knew that they. There's there's a theory there around being eaten by crabs. I mean, we'll come back to that. Let's circle back around. You know what? They've never done a Doctor episode on Amelia Earhart. I think that'd be a real the mystery. It's like the Agatha Christie episode, <gasps> but uh, but an Amelia Earhart episode. That'd be a really fun one. They've never really properly done like a pilot, like flying kind of like Top Gun episode of Doctor. I mean, I guess they kind of did in Victory of the Daleks, but not really. I think that'd be a really fun episode, They've, like a Top Gun style Amelia Earhart episode. There was an episode of Torchwood where a very Amelia Earhart esque pilot flew into the rift and got displaced in time oh, and yeah. flew out the other side um, in the modern day. And I guess in her time she went missing, but she actually just came to the future. Um, I think it was something like that. Didn't she fuck Owen? Probably. Probably, yeah. I feel like she did. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it was very tortured, very very Norsey's tortured. Mm. Yeah, it was. I don't know. So the conversation. I guess the reason they have the conversation. I guess maybe they're at a point in the relationship now where Rose is starting to develop those romantic feelings. In a way, she's almost like teasing the Doctor at this point, right? Because with Jack, she's like she's so young. She's getting that kind of almost like flirtation out of mm. her system. She, like any of us, loves the attention. I think she loves having the options mm-hmm. of having Mickey around when he's there because he's reliable and he's safe. She likes having Jack because mm. he's handsome and he takes an interest in her and it's thrilling as well to be kind of given a drink by mm-hmm. Big Ben. He kind of woos her that way and there's all the adrenaline of the adventure they're on and kind of thinks she was going to die and then she's getting rescued by a handsome man in his spaceship and he's kind of like the doctor but he kind of seems much more slick he's giving her the stuff that she wants from the doctor because i think she likes the doctor more which is why she's teasing him and stuff yeah but she keeps saying at the beginning of the episode she's like go on just give me some spot give me something and then when he's like i'll scan for alien tech and she's like finally some spock it's like here's this new time traveler who's really really handsome and he's got all the stuff that she was saying that she wants and then that's why she kind of goes out to the doctor and she's like well jack does this what do you do yeah. Exactly. And I think this is probably where her romantic feelings are starting to develop for the Doctor. And I guess she realizes mm. she loves his character and yada, 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 yada. So, I mean, it's that, I guess, isn't it? And I guess she's almost exploring if there was a romantic relationship, what would that look like? Because mm-hmm. how do I have even been with anyone? How do I even know how many penises you have? You're an alien. So... She doesn't oh ask that God, question. That's an interesting thought. Jackie does. She doesn't. <laughs> but <laughs> Is there anything else he's got two of? of? Leave him alone. Rose is thinking like, good question. <laughs> I do think there was a potential for a love triangle here, which they never really like develop into. But I will say, upon all of the rewatches of this series, I sort of forget how much this series lent. Because I always think of the early series of Doctor Who, like of New Doctor Who, as like having the one companion and the Doctor. But in this series, I worked out there are seven episodes where there's a TARDIS team, either with Adam or Jack. There's three episodes where it's just the Doctor and Rose. And then I would argue there are two episodes where Mickey and Jackie are kind of like co-companions for the episode. Like they have just as much screen time as like Rose does, for example. So out of the whole series, there are only three episodes where it's just the Doctor and Rose. That's quite surprising, but I think that works very well. I think picking up someone for a few episodes and changing the dynamic for a little bit works really nicely. And Jack was a great companion to bring along as well for the ride because he felt on some levels quite um, on par with the Doctor in that he had the technical experience. He has all this knowledge from the future as well. He Mm recognises things like the Daleks. He knows what the time war is. He used to be a time agent, so I guess he's got like a bit of a knowledge of like history as well. Um, And so he can help with things like kind of mechanics and flying the TARDIS. And they have um, a little bit of kind of buddying up on some of the more serious, dangerous situations. Like Jack knows Mm -hmm. how to use a weapon. And I think the Doctor doesn't like that 
he can kind of like talk to Jack about that kind of stuff and like the strategic stuff. And I think he probably hates this that is the stuff thing. being brought out of him. Yeah, I think you see it more in the finale of this series, but when they have to sort of plan how they're going to fight the Daleks, the Doctor and Jack almost have like an unspoken language where they immediately are both on the same page. They understand the same military tactics. They both have been at war before. And I think that also might, I mean, we'll talk about it more then, but that might partly be why he sends Rose away, not just to keep her safe, but also because he's like, I don't want you to see the man I am when I have to be at war with the Daleks. I think he's ashamed of all that as well. Yeah, and I think that's all a, a big part of, I think, why he is quite reluctant to, not just because he's impossible, because he's immortal, but I think he's reluctant to bring Jack anywhere because it's quite revealing um, for him, having all those those bits shown off, yeah. So I noticed one thing on the soundtrack. We did our marvellous soundtrack episode two episodes back. Do go and listen. <laughs> Every episode, I'm like, when's Alistair going to talk about the soundtrack? <laughs> Something we said in the soundtracks episode was that the Doctor Who theme itself is very rarely used as a motif. So when Jack swoops in and stops the bomb falling with his transmat beam, the Doctor Who theme plays. Um, it's kind of like an adjusted version it? of it. Yeah, it's kind of like a major... What do I mean? Like a major chord version? M- music terms? He, it, it's, it's, oh, uh, I completely missed that. Yeah, it's like a heroic version of the Doctor Who theme plays. It carries on for a bit as well, it goes on for about a minute. But if you listen back, it's, um, it's in there. It's not the best. That's cool. It's fine. The ones that were only shown on screen for the <laughs> series, um, it, they, they were only done on synthesizers. Um, the National yeah. Orchestra of Wales wasn't brought in until the Christmas special. So um, mm. unless it's on the piano, you are not going to hear <laughs> any real orchestras in this <laughs> A series. real instrument. Yeah. So until they were re-recorded for the soundtrack, you are only going to get those kind of files. Did you notice, so when I was looking for fun facts, the episode, which I'm sure we'll come into in a sec, um, I did listen back to this clip and I kind of heard what they meant. But in the scene where Nancy is cutting the barbed wire to break into the bomb site there's like a very early motif for what becomes the torchwood motif the dun 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 of torchwood it's a bit muddled it's not quite that yet it's not like they took it and then that was what became it but when you listen you can hear it it's a very early like like that kind of that's very cool which i thought was cool especially for jack's first episode yeah i love that um mummy's here and guess what what? She's got some fun facts for you. Ah, uh, Mummy's got the fun facts. Mummy always comes with the fun facts. Come on, Mummy. <laughs> so, um, as we mentioned in episode seven of the podcast, uh, this hospital is the same hospital that they bring the space pig to in Aliens of London. It's the Albion Hospital. Um, obviously the same one that was here in the 1940s, uh, which I thought was mm. cool. And the time agents, obviously Jack's time agent, uh, these are actually something that was referenced in Classic Who. It was first mentioned in The Talons of Wang Chang. So it's not a new oh. character or group of people to be introduced to Doctor Who. It's something being brought in from Classic Who, which I didn't know until looking up facts of this episode. I'd never heard that before. Good fact. Colin Baker has previously said that the Doctor Stance is his favourite episode of New Who, um, and he loves the Everybody Lives scene. Really? Yeah, I think it's the scene at the end where it can show that you can have a real like horrific episode but nobody has to die he really liked that oh colin oh the sixth bake the sixth the sixth baker the sixth doctor <laughs> did not have the best run and colin baker he did not is i think such a nice man <laughs> he's such a sweetie so sorry for him like every time i see him i just think like and i feel awful as well because his and the seventh doctors are probably i mean i'm gonna get like slaughtered for this but they're probably the stories i'm least <laughs> interested in seeing i will say they're mm. the third doctors are the ones i'm most interested to see but um but whenever I, I wonder what it is about the third doctor that's really hooked you um whenever i've seen john pertwee stories like clips of um something just fascinates me about it i don't know there's something about his portrayal i i really like i think he's got a little bit i mean there's something obviously very camp about that doctor i think actually mm. the way that he dresses and his hair and everything else i think he lays the groundwork very for a lot of stuff that later doctors can do just like patrick Troughton did um i mean they all mm-hmm. did they all left like you know things that have been picked up later on 
But um, there's camp elements of things, even like the car with Bessie, the karate chops he does. There's all kinds of bits. I think I've seen him do interviews as well around the show where he's obviously very proud of the character. I, yeah, I'm very keen to watch some mm-hmm. um, some Third Doctor stories. <laughs> no, we should watch what well, we need to watch it for the podcast. We still, can you believe that we are into the double digits of our podcast and we still haven't watched an episode of Classic Code? Double digits, baby. Double digits. Um, quick couple more facts. Um, I need to fact source this, but it was from IMDb Trivia, so I do have faith. Apparently, Russell T. Davies said that he named Jack Harkness after the Marvel character Agatha Harkness. Okay, I just fact check you that that's actually true. I didn't believe that could be it true. It is. Um, he's actually used... It felt too good to be true. Yes. Um, it, it's actually used it more than once. He actually also used it in his soap opera, The Grand, and in Doctor Who. Oh my god. Russell T is apparently a big fan of Titanic. So can you guess where he got the names for two people in this episode? He did not name Rose after Kate Winslet, did he? Apparently Rose and Jack. Really? Rose and Jack from the Titanic. We are finishing talking about Doctor Who, uh, The Empty Child and the Doctor Dances. Did you like these episodes? I love these episodes. I mean, I should go without saying, but I think these are really quality. Um, I really enjoyed the rewatch. I was watching it on the train and I was actually sending you screenshots mm-hmm. as well from it. It's an awful lot of food, isn't it, Mr. Lloyd? Off the street thinks your missus must be messing about with Mr. Ratherstock, the butcher. But she's not, is she? You are. Oh, look. There's the sweat on your brow. <laughs> it's so iconic. And he just sits there sweating and his wife's Heather from EastEnders. Oh, my we God. We shouldn't be I gagged because someone, she threatens to out a gay man. And we're like, gagged, gagged, gagged. Like, no. Like, yeah, but you know what? You know what? Mother needs to provide her food. Mother's providing. She is mother. Mother. We should be like, no, cancel Nancy, the homophobe who is leveraging his sexuality for personal gain. Who is more of a homophobe, Nancy in the 1940s or Rose mm-hmm. in 2005? Um, <laughs> somehow still Rose, I okay. think. <laughs> is gonna say the same thing you're so gay i feel like somehow nancy was more of an ally i i'm getting queer vibes from jamie so i don't know i know so i i see i get queer vibes from jamie i get queer vibes from nancy rose is someone who would say that they wouldn't want to date a bisexual because it's just not for me queer vibes from jamie because he's much too attached to his mother exactly she is mother he knows she's mother i wish that um instead of are you my mummy it's where's mother Where's mother? Where's mother? <laughs> Oi, mister, you mean mum? Okay, we're going to get cancelled for like seven different things. Oh my Queer God. vibes on children and then appropriating mother. So, I mean, good luck, everyone. Okay, well, before we do, uh, I'll say thank you so much for listening to this episode of Hula La. Um, as always, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram to keep the conversation going. You can catch up on old episodes of the podcast on our YouTube channel and see us here next week where we'll be discussing a fun topic of the Hula Lovers. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. And we will see you next week. We're so excited to see you. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks so much. See you then.